Hey guys, it's Shaylin. I'm here today with another writing video. So today we're going to be talking about creating atmosphere and how to create more immersive work. This is a topic I'm really excited to discuss. Well, I actually did an old video I long ago private that was on this topic that got like 45,000 views and I rewatched it before filming this video and damn, the tips in it were so basic and I'm gonna guess that this video not gonna get 45,000 views because it doesn't happen anymore. This is gonna be the better video. So if you stuck around since then, congratulations. You're gonna get some real juicy content, unlike that one, which was not great. I love talking about atmosphere because it's something that I strive for. It's one of the things that I probably strive for the most. And it's probably because I view my work essentially just as an atmosphere. My ideas usually start from like a vibe. And then I have to construct a whole plot line and character in order to capture that vibe. So for me, a piece of writing is just a story that I built around the atmosphere. Like it was all about the vibes. I am very much a vibes writer. And so I think that that's probably why it shows in my work because it's where all my ideas start. It's just like a, a, a mood, an atmosphere, a vibe. And then it starts to solidify and a story emerges from the vibe. You know, it's something I care about so much as a reader. If there isn't really a strong atmosphere, I find it so hard to stay engaged. So it's definitely a priority for my work in terms of what I write and what I read. So I'm hoping that today I can share some tips on how to make your writing more immersive and how to create atmosphere. Before we get into some more applicable tips, let's do a deep dive into what actually builds the atmosphere of a piece. Atmosphere is one of the hardest elements of a story to pin down because it's the combination of so many aesthetic, sonic, emotional, and technical elements of a story. It's something somewhat inexplicable. It's just kind of a vibe, a feeling, a certain je ne sais quoi that can be hard to explain. It's something you just know when you see it, or more accurately, it's something you just feel. Like all elements of story, atmosphere is created by the combination of what you say and how you say it. The sensory and emotional qualities of a scene, as well as the words and structure you use to convey them. So let's talk about some of the factors that go into building atmosphere. First, let's think about contrast and space. Atmosphere can be built in the contrast between space and negative space. Where are we presenting imagery? Where is the sound, color, texture? Where, conversely, is there silence? Negative space, emptiness. Atmosphere is one of the elements of story that is best shown rather than told. So the balance is in presenting the proper imagery in the right way in order to allow the reader to feel the mood you want to create. You can't really say the story feels nostalgic or feels eerie or feels hopeful. That's something that has to be felt and stating it often dispels it, especially because there often is no exact word to describe a piece's atmosphere. It's something complex and kind of just innate to the piece. It's just something you feel. We can come up with various descriptors to try and explain what the atmosphere of a certain piece feels like, but it's almost always so much more complex than that. Another factor in creating atmosphere is sound. Both the sounds described in the world and the sounds in the words you use to describe the scene. Sound has very powerful atmospheric qualities, which can be seen in how a song, an artistic medium that has no visual component, can convey a very powerful sense of atmosphere, often inciting very deep emotions or even visual imagery just through its sonic quality. We can replicate that idea through the musicality of our prose. Another thing to think about is color. I often find that books with distinct and immersive atmosphere have a powerful sense of color and a distinct color palette. I feel this especially strongly in my own work, perhaps because I have a very innate connection to it. I feel like I can mentally distill everything I write into a very specific color palette that kind of feels present and washed over the entire piece. This can be conveyed quite literally by describing the colors present in the world or merely implied through the imagery. Let's compare different images of a beach with very different color palettes. Here, there is a soft blue color palette. The washed out pale nature, to me, gives this image a nostalgic feeling, a content moment, but there's a tinge of sadness there. Like maybe it's the last day of summer, perhaps the last day spent with a friend I won't see for a long time. It's overall content, peaceful, but I don't know, there's something slightly melancholic to it. In this image, the color palette is drained, almost monochromatic, but not quite, and the desaturated nature feels lonely and cold and 
somber. I feel alone, but there's also some clarity in that. It almost feels like the first moment of stillness after you've been crying and you open your eyes. The final image of the set here has a very deep saturated blue color palette and low light. I feel like this image almost hums with sound. You know, there's a neon quality to it, like a power line. The image feels kind of foreboding, but not in a malicious way. There's just an intensity to it, a power to the scene, an eerie curiosity. It's kind of crackling with energy. All three images in different ways have a bit of an ache to them. I was drawn to all three, but that ache is different. It presses on different emotional notes, and I almost don't really know how to put it into words better than just presenting you with the image itself, which is what you can do in your own work. You don't have to explain the atmosphere. You can just show it. It may be inexplicable, but it can still be experienced. One of the most powerful ways to create atmospheres with powerful imagery, what are we looking at? And more than that, how? What details are we focused in on? Are we using any literary devices to convey extra meaning of emotion and create mood? How we describe an image is how we are framing it in the narrative. You can think about if your scene was a film, how the different camera angles focusing on different details could create very distinct or different effects. Take these two images of snow. In the first, we're looking up at snowy branches from below, and the angle and wideness of the shot highlights the spindly, eerie nature of the frozen trees. Places our viewpoint below makes us feel small, almost trapped. In the second, we're focused closely on the very fine detail of pine needles encased in frost. To me, this image feels very delicate, makes me think of the whimsy of walking through fresh snow. While the first image felt kind of insecure and foreboding, the second to me feels nostalgic and cozy. Just like atmosphere is created in the contrast of space and negative space between sound and silence, it's also created in the contrast of motion and stillness. A truly still moment is incredibly rare, if not impossible, to experience because of the inherent motion of your own life and presence. Therefore, a moving world is a living world, and a living world is an immersive world. But we can still find contrast. The neon quickness of a city at night, alive and noisy and intense, versus perhaps sitting in a parked car with your best friend outside a diner in the middle of the night, feeling like your quiet voices are the only sound left in the world. In the first, you are the quiet in the loud. But in the second, you are the loud, the potency in the quiet. Sometimes motion is what emphasizes stillness, watching the city pass out the window when you're alone in a train car at night, or the curtains slowly oscillating as you overlook sunrise, or the very subtle shift of a shadow against the wall. Another component of atmosphere is texture. The tactility of texture makes it a beautiful and effective mode to convey specific and visceral sensory experiences that are imbued with emotion. Even through figurative language, texture can be how we touch the world of the story. How does it feel to be told the fog hanging over the city looked like velvet? versus looked like wool, versus looked like the pelt of a wolf? How does it feel to touch, through the character, the skin of a ripe peach, versus the dew on a cold bottle of water? How does it feel to see the same image in hazy softness, versus in crisp alertness? When we're constructing a scene, the reader is going to be pulled into the story through the rhythm of the language, so this can become another tool in creating atmosphere. The music and pace of a scene can convey, much like the melody of a song, the rhythm of the character's thoughts and emotions. The flow of the sentences can enhance and convey so much feeling. Is the moment languid, hazy, sharp, devastating? Is it a moment where the character is in a dazed, confused state, or a moment of truth, clarity? And realization? But sensory value isn't the entirety of atmosphere, so much of it comes from emotion and feeling. What are we feeling here? And more importantly, what is the emotional relevance of this moment, this place, to this character? Powerful mood and atmosphere aren't just in the imagery itself, but the emotions these images express, what they stir in us. How are the emotional beats of the story felt? Moments of great pain, loneliness, transcendence, tiny moments that hold great weight. That's one of the most powerful uses of atmosphere. It gives weight to a moment. It makes the moments of the story tangible. If we're thinking of atmosphere as this intersection point between the senses and the story's feelings, so much of this comes down to the story's viewpoint. Whose eyes are we seeing and feeling the world from? The images I've shown throughout may have conjured specific feelings, maybe even raised specific memories for you, but these associations are different for everyone, and in the case of your story, the question is not about what associations the reader has, but the character. What does this moment feel like to this character? The question is not, what does it feel like to be in this moment as ourselves? The question is, what does it feel like to be this specific person in this specific moment? And why is that important? That is how even the smallest, subtlest moments of a story can be unforgettable. And a powerful atmosphere and mood is a huge part of that. If a story is a capturing of a specific person's experience, then the atmosphere is a capturing of what it feels like, both emotionally and physically, to be that person. 
There is no such thing as a universal experience, but good and relatable writing isn't universal. It's specific because that's where truth is found. Universal truth does not really exist, but specific personal truth does, and it is powerful. That's the power of atmosphere. It can pull the reader into the story so they feel and touch and experience it as a tangible living thing. They can forge a connection with the story and character, not just on emotional level, but tactile one. Creating powerful atmosphere is not just about creating beautiful imagery, but allowing that imagery to live through the character so it becomes tangible, visceral, even bodily. When atmosphere is effective, we don't just see it, we feel it. And that feeling can be complex and hard to explain or dissect into its various components. Atmosphere is greater than the sum of its parts. It's not all these little pieces I've just described, but rather the overall effect and ability to immerse a reader fully into the story. I'd say that's the big takeaway for creating atmosphere. Not to ask, what does this look like? But how does it feel? Not to ask what is around this character, but what does it feel like to be this character? in this moment. So with all of that in mind, let's kind of take this idea of what atmosphere is, even as slippery and amorphous as it is, and talk about some ways to actually apply it to your story. Tip number one is you want to be creating atmosphere from your character's perspective. Atmosphere is where the sensory and emotional components of your story cross over. It's the visual and sensory aesthetic and feeling of the piece, but it's also the emotional landscape of the piece and how those things reflect each other. It's not just, ooh, the book is set on a beach, how atmospheric. It's what feeling are we gonna get from this book being set on the beach? So really lean into the POV of your story. I think that having a close psychic distance often helps here. Hard for a work to feel immersive and by extension atmospheric if you have a distant POV. Distant POV has its time and place for sure, but I would say that most of the time, unless you intentionally have a really intentional reason why you want a distant POV, most of the time a work is going to feel more immersive and more engaging with a closer POV. Typically, I would say that when there's a really distant POV, it's often not intentional and it just comes from a lack of understanding of how to control POV and psychic distance. Learning about psychic distance can really help your work feel more immersive. You know, when you're really engaged with the character on a sensory level, that usually pulls us closer into the psychic distance. A character's emotional state and how that is expressed through the visual and aesthetic and sensory aspect is such a big part of atmosphere. So use that, use emotion. It's Atmosphere is not just about setting, it's about setting and emotion together. Second tip is to use tone. Tone is the story's view towards itself or the narrator's view towards the story. And it's really useful to use tone because it helps cast the story really in the narrator's perspective rather than it just feeling generic and almost point of viewless. Like if there's no tone, it can feel like there's no personality. Tone really gives a work personality. Does your narrator view the story in kind of a coy, cheeky way? Is the story maybe absurd or, you know, campy? Is it very serious? Is it very, you know, maybe melancholic? How does the narrating body view the story or how does the story view itself? Because those aren't necessarily always the same thing. Sometimes they're the same, but sometimes they're different. Sometimes your narrating body, your your narrator is the creator of the tone based on how they view the story, but sometimes your main character may view the story in, say, a very serious manner, but the tone of the story, the way the story views itself, is maybe making fun of it and it's more of a comedy. Really understand tone and leaning into tone can give the work a lot of personality, which makes it a lot more immersive because we really feel immersed into a, pers a POV. Tip number three, remember to ground the scene in the body. Your character probably has a body. If they don't have a body, I don't know. Are they a ghost? Then grounded in their ghostly form. In all likelihood, your character does have a body. And remember that the body and the scene are not separate things. The character is a living vessel within the scene. A character is a physically present body in a situation. What does that feel like? How is your character interacting with the world of the scene? And by extension, how is the world interacting with them? We often are told the most basic piece of advice when creating atmosphere is to use all of the senses which is true, but I think a more rounded way to think about that is to just think about the character as like a living body in the scene. They are experiencing it in like a multi-sensory way. It's not just what smells are in the air, it's 
what is the character smelling and how are they interpreting that and how does that what does that feel to them what are they doing how are they physically interacting with the scene how is the scene maybe interacting with them are there other people are they interacting take that idea of using all the senses and think of it in a more three-dimensional way like this is a living scene that is actively happening to your character i think that's how you create really visceral writing is not just when there are descriptions of multiple senses in like a checklist kind of way but when multiple types of sensory descriptions are being felt in an active living way by the character don't lose sense of the body in terms of where they are what they are doing and what they are experiencing to remember four is to add movement to the world and this is a really simple tip that i think is really helpful static world doesn't really feel immersive because the world is not static movement can really help the setting feel more alive if i'm just right now i'm in my room i'm alone but outside I can see that the wind is shaking the branches and I can hear the cars going past outside and I can hear my neighbor rummaging through their shed. There is almost always movement to the world. Maybe in rare cases there's not if the character is in a still room, but like if they're in a room completely enclosed from the outside world is the light bulb totally flickering and still there's movement. How are they moving? It's so quiet. Can they hear their heart beating? There's a pretty much always movement unless you're in a completely enclosed room with no living being, in which case who is describing the scene? The next tip is to use visual references. This is a tip that some may find somewhat silly how I'm going to describe it, but to that I say sometimes a mood board is something that can be so personal. I used to do that when I was writing certain pieces and I really wanted to be immersed in. I would make like a mood board or pick an image that really captured that atmosphere and I would make it my desktop background. No matter what, I actually think visual references can really help. It's hard to create an atmospheric scene if you can't visualize it clearly yourself. If you can't visualize it clearly, then find visual references and do whatever you gotta do to immerse yourself in them. Tip number six is to think about the color palette. This is something that I care about so deeply. I, I simply love to talk about the color palette of my work. Every work that I write has a color palette. This is the realest thing for me. Like all my short stories have a distinct color palette and my novels usually also distinct color palette, but maybe it's a little more broad because the setting might shift more over the course of the novel, but still understand the color palette. Like when I think about my work, I think about like a few images that like are the purest distillation of the atmosphere and like the color palette. I like to try and imbue that color palette through the description, like describing those colors, picking imagery that evokes those colors. In Holding a Ghost, it's like kind of this muted soft gold, orange, pink. Whereas like in honey vinegar, it's like gray, green, earth. So I think it really helps to really think of the color palette of your work. Actually create that color palette through the scenes, through the imagery. This is why I'm constantly describing the sky because it sets the scene for the color palette that I am going for. Tip number seven is one that I've talked about before and it's to create a language ecosystem. Like in a real e ecosystem, some plants, animals, insects, etc., will grow and thrive in that ecosystem, whereas others could not. And I like to think about my work the same way linguistically. It has its own ecosystem where some words can grow and other words cannot grow. I'm going to make a video on this topic, post it before I post this video, so you can find a link to that in the description. <laughs> I think this is so helpful for creating a consistent voice and a consistent atmosphere because you use words that are all within the same realm, both tonally, like how they feel, how they taste, the feel of the words, and like also like maybe the topic of the words, the connotation of the words. Next step is to use your analogies carefully. So a simile or metaphor, compare something that is tangibly in the world usually, but it could also be an emotion, to something that is outside the the story. So we're taking an image from the world and we're comparing it to something actually outside the story. So when you're bringing in outside imagery, you want to think about how does that imagery contribute to the story. This is actually kind of part of the linguistic ecosystem. Can that simile, that comparison grow in this ecosystem? Or are you bringing in something from a completely different ecosystem that's going to feel really, really jarring? I would really think carefully about using your analogies as a way to build atmosphere because that's where you can get these really jarring, incongruous images because you can pull from anything. Something that feels in the world of the story in the atmosphere of the atmospheric scope of the story, even if it isn't tangibly there. My final tip is when you're actually choosing the settings, like choose the settings intentionally, not just the setting of your whole book, but the settings of the individual scenes. I wrote this YA book when I was younger and I had such a distinct vision for the atmosphere of the book. You know, it was gonna be set in this small little town on the coast 
it was gonna be like gloomy and stormy and the color palette was very distinct in my mind like you know like very soft blues and grays then in individual scenes we ended up with so many scenes that were just the main character that was just the main character in her room i didn't pick the settings of the actual scenes intentionally enough i kind of realized okay next time i do the draft of that book which i don't know when that's going to be thinking about picking the settings like a scene where the main character is in her room having a conversation with her friend why don't i set that out of lighthouse right like there's no reason why i couldn't just set these scenes in more interesting places that would contribute to the atmosphere of my book rather than just having scene after scene in her room which wasn't really contributing to the atmosphere of the book in the way that i envisioned it because i envisioned such a strong atmosphere for this book that i think could be such a selling point in it but the individual scenes i wasn't really picking the settings intentionally it was starting to get really repetitive i couldn't just keep describing her room over and over and so there was like no setting description and so i think like just picking the settings of individual scenes really intentionally in order to benefit the atmosphere you want to create so i unfortunately lost a bunch of the footage from this video so i'm just gonna jump in and cover them as a voiceover because i do think that they were helpful points to cover the first one builds off this idea of movement that i already talked about about how like a moving world is a living world and it's to not just think about the movement but to think about how the story is kind of moving beyond the edges of the page what's moving in the background i think that it's really important that we have a sense that the story or the scene exists in like a larger living world so you know this can be really really subtle stuff um you know if the characters are on a beach you know is there a drawing that someone before them has left in the sand it can be as simple as a car driving past the window outside stuff in the background or kind of moving beyond the edges of the world that kind of imply and show that other people live here this is a broader world beyond the story and even if the scope is really really contained i think that this really adds to the atmosphere and makes the world feel so much more lived in thinking of movement in the human sense right so there's movement in like the world itself clouds moving in the sky or whatever but thinking about movement specifically in the context of people and kind of the signs of existence of other people the second tip is to think about the proper names in your piece you know there are a lot of factors that go into naming characters or naming places so this is maybe not always going to be your only factor sometimes you'll have way more important factors that go into the names more you know limitations but proper names in a piece you know maybe the names of places but especially the names of characters they're really important words in a piece if i'm writing a story that has more of like a weird or like fairy tale or like ethereal tone i'll really look for kind of weirder ethereal names really uncommon names but if i'm writing a story that's really grounded really realistic i'll probably go for very common names um, at least, you know, common to, like, the setting that the story is taking place in. There are a lot of things to consider with naming characters that can often come back to, like, the logistics of the story and what's realistic for the character can contribute to, to the atmosphere. Yeah. Tip is something that actually builds off this idea of linguistic ecosystems, but it's just, like, a specific point within that that I wanted to touch on because I think it's really helpful, is to really think about words that specifically come from your setting. This is especially helpful if you have a really specific setting. This would be difficult if, say, your piece is kind of set in, like, an unnamed city. I think it really helps to think of the words that are very specifically from that setting. Specific names of plants and animals, maybe regional slang or like historical word choice that's very specific to the time and place. Words relating to like the industry of the town in my novel Honey Vinegar, it's set in a logging town and it's also set in the 1950s and so in that book I think a big contributor to the atmosphere was really thinking about the word choice that was so specifically from that setting. Words that were specifically relating to the logging industry in the town or that felt maybe more specific to the time period. Clothing that maybe kind of would be out of style now. Especially the nouns that are so specific to the world. So the next tip is something kind of on the inverse. It's not something that you want to be including to create atmosphere, but it's actually what to look for in terms of what breaks the atmosphere, and it's to look for anything authorial. So this is quite a large topic. I feel like I'm only going to be able to just very briefly cover it in this video. A really important quality in immersive writing is the lack of anything authorial. And so by authorial, I mean a point where you feel the author's presence in the story. Ideally, in a very immersive way, work you would never feel the author's presence you would just experience the story as an entity of itself i wish i could give you a comprehensive list of things to avoid here that feel authorial but to be honest it could go on and on and on but for example lapses in the logic of the voice or lapses in the point of view authorialness can happen 
on the broader scale as well, you know, if you feel like a plot point was contrived, say that a character only acted in a certain way in order to make something happen in the plot, but it was totally out of context and character for everything we knew about them. Feeling like the author is kind of trying to control how you feel about the characters rather than letting you form as the reader form your own judgments, that can be very authorial. That really breaks the immersion. A controlling writer often will have a really strong authorial presence in the work, which is what we don't want. We don't want to feel the author authors looking over our shoulder as we read saying, hey, you should feel this way about the scene. Oh, you should feel this way about this character. Oh, this can even come down to word choice, telling things that otherwise the reader could interpret on their own, but they're being told just because the, re the writer really wants to make sure that you get it. This is really about what you don't include rather than about what you include, which can be just as important. The whole point of a strong atmosphere is that it's fully immersive. Anytime there's kind of like an authorial intrusion um, that can really break the atmosphere that you've created, because it feels manufactured rather than feeling organic. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about here is throw off your detail. This just comes down to how to make your details feel more lived in, actually reflect the weirdness and the messiness of life. We can think about kind of throwing the details off a tiny bit, making them a little off kilter. If we were describing a kitchen and we said that there's a tile backsplash and a fridge humming in the corner and an empty sink, those things may be true, but I think it's less effective than being able to pick about how those things are part of a lived in environment. You know, maybe there's some ketchup splattered to the backsplash or a magnet on the fridge has slid out of place, or there's a damp tea towel hanging from the leaking faucet. All of these things feel more powerful and more vivid because they're more specific, but they're also a little off kilter. They reflect that this is a real place that real people live and it feels like a real environment rather than a show home. Where's the presence of life, right? In this kitchen, and this applies to literally any environment. A lot about picking really interesting details and creating vivid writing, which is often, you know, immersive and atmospheric, is about really carefully selecting your details so that those details, rather than maybe feeling inherent or obvious, are a little more surprising maybe a little more messy. Rather than thinking about what's working or what's perfect, thinking about what's not working, thinking about what's broken. Think about how you can surprise the reader with a detail that's insightful, a little thrown off. It's not a perfect detail, but like nothing in life is perfect, right? Thinking about like those imperfect details, those are often way more surprising, way more specific, way more interesting. They grab the reader's attention. I don't think if I'm just giving you this long description of a kitchen of very basic, exactly what, you know, a stock image of a kitchen looks like, they'll start to kind of doze off because you don't really care. There's nothing really that interesting, but as soon as there's something kind of weird, by weird, it's actually more realistic, you know, something specific, something interesting. That's, I think, when the reader's attention is pulled into the scene, and that's how you make the writing way more immersive and therefore way more atmospheric. The book won't be atmospheric if you're losing the reader's attention with kind of pages of predictable detail. Instead of a bunch of predictable detail, if that can be turned into one really impactful detail, you'll end up with much more immersive scene writing. That is my little chat on atmosphere. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in another video.